We're talking about interspecific relationships today as we build up a community to talk about community ecology next time. But I need to finish with a few points on population dynamics that we didn't get to last time. Then we'll, we'll survey the types of interspecific relationship that exist in nature and focus on competition because of its historical importance in ecology and its importance in structuring communities, the forces of competition. We'll briefly look at how we can model interspecific relationships through a modification of, uh, of some of the models that we will have seen previously. And then we'll finish with a discussion of predator-prey dynamics, a particular type of interspecific relationship that's amenable to modeling. We finished last time talking about exponential growth, and we looked at examples that included um, elephants in South Africa and elephant seals on our own coast here and humans ourselves in terms of natural examples where populations, in those cases of large vertebrates, are increasing exponentially. And we noted that no creature can increase exponentially for very long because they would quickly overtake and bury everything else on the earth, and that just doesn't happen. So what does happen to these populations to check their growth? Because intrinsically, they have that capacity. All organisms, by nature of the way they reproduce, whether sexual or asexual, can increase exponentially, but they don't forever. So what gives? Um, we can divide the, the pressures that act on populations into density-independent forces or factors and density-dependent factors that serve to help regulate, if you want, these populations. Density-independent factors are usually thought of in the context of abiotic factors. Um, singular events, sometimes singular dramatic events, like a, like a big landslide. If you get a big landslide, that landslide is going to affect the organisms that live uh, in its wake, regardless of how densely they're arrayed, regardless of their dispersion pattern, they're going to impact all the organisms that are mowed over. If your, if your pine tree here is in an extremely dense stand, it's going to fall and be buried. If there are just two pines there, they're going to fall and be buried. It doesn't matter how dense they are. That population is going to be affected regardless of its density. That's what's meant by it being a density independent factor, the landslide. Or an ice storm um, of freezing temperatures, sudden freezing temperatures, generally won't affect creatures based on their density. They'll either freeze or they won't. They'll either break, snap, or they won't. And that's not always entirely true because a stand of trees may be buffered interiorly relative to the edge such that a dense stand of trees might actually be buffered against cold temperatures because of warmer conditions in the interior. So there can be some subtleties in which uh, simple abiotic examples don't always fit a density-independent pattern, a tornado, um, similarly. Density-dependent factors include interactions like competition. When density goes up, competition may become more intense between individuals. And, um, and you have a couple of rhinoceros beetles there as an example. I have a couple of videos you can click later when you get your PDF if you want to watch rhinoceros beetles in action. There's been some great research, including out of Berkeley, on these guys. The fact that organisms, as they increase in density, they start to pollute their environment, oftentimes. If the organisms that help to recycle their waste don't keep pace, or if the environment is constructed in such a way that the wastes aren't readily disposed of, those organisms, by increasing in density, can foul their own environment and poison themselves. Um, and that, that does happen in some cases. Parasitism and infectious diseases, the transmission rates, propagation rates, can go up in more dense populations. Predators may start to focus more on prey that are densely, um, densely arrayed. By becoming dense, a predator may switch its focus to that prey. That happens a lot in fish when different aquatic insects are, um, are blooming at different times. The fish will focus on one while it's, in, while it's blooming and hatching, and as it wanes in numbers, it'll switch to another one that's, that's then becoming more numerous. And that's what a fly fisherman does. A good fly fisherman is going to know the cycles of the aquatic insects and use the flies, use their uh, artificial flies that mimic the insects that are active at any particular time because the fish are focused on those insects. There can be physiological mechanisms just intrinsic to the population that help regulate those populations when they become dense. Hormones and physiological reactions can change when density goes up, causing increased stress, increased aggression, higher mortality, and lower birth rates. And that can impact population numbers as well, in addition to these four, these four factors, those types of intrinsic factors. Competition is one of the best studies of these factors. Here's just an example from a, a type of plant, plantains, where they're, they were cultivated at different densities, ranging from very few to very many per meter squared on a logarithmic scale. You can see their reproductive effort. The number of seeds they produce per individual went down linearly on this logarithmic scale. A negative correlation between fecundity and density in this plant. Another example from a bird, song sparrows, which can become quite dense in areas. We have these birds here in Berkeley. At high densities, represented by just the number of females in an area, the breeding females, at high densities, the clutches are smaller. And that's presumably, based on the study, the inference was that this was related to competition among females primarily for food resources. Not enough food, not enough resources to dedicate to reproduction in the dense population. So we need to modify our exponential model in a way that accounts for the reality of these checks on growth. And the logistic model is um, what's used in ecology uh, to, to represent such checks. With the logistic model, we need this new term, Carrying capacity. You've been introduced to it in lab, of course. The carrying capacity, you can think of it as the maximum number of individuals that a particular environment can support. But what I particularly want you to recognize about carrying capacity is it's dynamic. It's different in different places. It can be different from one hill to the next hill, but it also, also changes in time. At one year, the carrying capacity may be different than it is the following year because of everything else that changes. The carrying capacity of an environment is related to many aspects of that environment. Not just, a, although one single factor may predominate, it's a complex of factors that influence carrying capacity. There's our, uh, our exponential model in, in a DNDT form in terms of instantaneous growth. And what we need to modify that model with is this new term that relates the number of individuals that exist in the population to the carrying capacity in a way that as the number of individuals increases, the growth rate of the population will decrease. And can eventually, this side of the equation can eventually go negative. I'll unpack that a little bit, but if you haven't grasped that yet from lab, you need to wrestle with it on your own time a little bit as well. But what we can see is 
as n approaches k, the numerator of this equation is going to become smaller. It's going to approach zero, and it may eventually become negative, making the whole side of this equation negative, and thus producing a negative change in numbers with time, decreasing population size. So not only will the addition of this term allow um, us to express the slowing of growth, but it'll, it'll allow us to express the actual decreasing numbers as well. And the shape of that curve is like an S. So the logistic model uh, is sometimes, and this curve is sometimes called an S-shaped curve. Your carrying capacity is, uh, is a line here. It's set at this, the carrying capacity in this case is this number of individuals, whatever that number is. And the S-shaped curve arrives as an asymptote to that line in time, number of generations in that case of time. So you have your S-shaped curve in contrast to your J-shaped exponential, right? And in this case, uh, it's filled in a little more. Your carrying capacity is 1,500 individuals. And there you see it here. So forget these different types of R that the book gives you. I'm not distinguishing different types of R. There's a lot of literature. There's a huge literature on the intrinsic growth rate of populations dating back 100 years. I'm just speaking of R generally as the intrinsic growth rate per intrinsic per capita growth rate of the population. We don't need to worry about R max or R instantaneous or the differences that the book presents. What I want you to get from this um, table is a recognition of how the population changes in numbers in time based on how many individuals the population starts with. When the population is small, with a carrying capacity of 1,500, when the population is small relative to that with only 25 individuals and an R of 1, 25 individuals are going to be added in the interval in question. As the population grows, still more individuals are added, even though R hasn't changed, because the starting point is greater. There's a greater number of individuals to begin with. And that's what makes this exponential, because the growth is proportional to the number of individuals that you start with. So this is an exponential growth phase here. Even in the logistic model, this is an exponential growth phase. It's the J-shaped portion of the S-curve. Look where the numbers of individuals added to the population reach a maximum at, some, at about halfway to the carrying capacity. And it's at this inflection point that then, as a result of this term, that then the numbers of individuals added start to decrease until they go to zero at carrying capacity. And you can plug those numbers in and, and see it for yourself. Sometimes, sometimes you know, you kind of understand it. But then if you actually write this out and you know, do the math, then you really, you really can see what's happening with this equation. It's really elegant. It's a really beautiful equation. And it reflects um, actual populations that have been studied both in the field and the lab, but rarely so neatly. Um, it's a mathematical ideal. And we use it to model and understand and predict what's going to happen with populations. But it's an ideal. And natural populations um, are usually noisier than the ideal. But there are great examples where it fits nicely, an S-shaped curve to um, populations, particularly under controlled conditions like this in the laboratory, in this case with paramecia. A lot of times what you see in a natural population is the overshooting of carrying capacity with a time lag before it returns to uh, around carrying capacity. And then it may fluctuate around carrying capacity. So with an overshoot and a time lag before the population responds, before births and deaths change to the point where they influence and regulate this exponential growth. There can be a time lag in the because that's in the nature of the organism in the way it reproduces and um, survives or does not survive. There's a, an important exception to the, to the normal interpretations of uh, the influence, particularly of, well, the influence of population size on population growth. What I've just explained are the classic models, where at small population sizes, all else being equal, and resources not being severely limiting at those population sizes, when the population is not near its carrying capacity, it's predicted to grow exponentially. On that basis, you would expect a small population to um, be growing rapidly, any small population. And the smaller it is, um, well, at those small sizes, it's expected to grow exponentially. But not all populations do. And that was an important insight. It's usually just a footnote in a textbook, but it's actually a pretty important uh, little piece of information. Warder Clyde Alley, an ecologist from the University of Chicago, talked about this, and it's become known as the Alley effect after him. Here's your, on this, on this graph, with population density on the x and r on the y, your standard density dependence would just be a straight line. As density increases, your per capita growth rate um, is expected to go down, at least after the inflection point in the growth model. What Ali noted was that, what Ali noted was that in very small populations, populations can get to a certain size, below which their per capita growth rate will actually be negative. Populations can be at a small size, which can inhibit their growth. Some populations need a certain size in order to have positive growth. Can you think of populations that might require a certain number of minimum individuals to be successful? Yeah. Excuse me, penguins? Yeah, so an animal like penguins, maybe that needs to thermoregulate, if that's what you were thinking about. You may have to have enough individuals to keep warm. Yeah. Pandas, like giant pandas? What, what about them? They're spread apart, so they may have trouble finding each other. If an animal has become so few in numbers that they have trouble finding each other during mating season, they may, have, they may fail to reproduce. Great examples. If that's what you guys are both thinking about with penguins and pandas. Yes. Schooling fish. A big school of fish um, may be focused on by sharks or predators, and they may lose a lot of individuals. But they can usually handle that. But if they get too small of a, to too small of a size, that little fish meatball will become all too easy to consume, and they'll just all be eaten. They get down to a certain size, and all of a sudden, they get into negative, into negative R territory, and they're going to slide to local extinction. Any other examples? Yes? Yes. So the example there is coyotes that move in packs, or a pack, a pack, uh, a pack animal, an animal that needs a certain numbers in order to take down prey. And yeah, they'd be a good example. Wolves or um, painted dogs or um, any animal that's going to be attacking prey larger than itself may require certain numbers of individuals to eat. And you get too few painted dogs, and they can't actually eat the wildebeest that they're chasing because there aren't enough of them to kill them. Great examples. One um, example that's uh, that's interesting is a case like the little fish that are sold in pet stores in aquaria, the really colorful cichlids that get usually taken from the wild, the really rare ones. Lakes in Africa that have these, these cichlids may occupy just a single rocky outcrop in, a, in the entire world. The species may be just a little island in Lake Tanganyika. And the rarer it becomes, the more valuable it is on the, black, on the market, in the pet stores and so forth. 
And so the more rare it becomes, the more valuable it is, the more people can make by going and taking them. And the smaller the population gets, the more valuable they come, and the more they become unfocused. And these populations can slide to extinction because they become so valuable in the pet trade. So anthropogenic, or a uh, human-related example of Ali effect. See how, yeah, you guys came up with them quickly, excellent. Um, and they can be quite common. <coughs> that's a, a spectacular example of parasitism. The, um, the cichlid apparently doesn't realize that she's raising um, the young of another species. You might wonder why she doesn't learn to realize, but <clears throat> that's the case. And I'll show you one more example, a case of similar parasitism that happens here in Berkeley among birds in a minute. Here we have our water buffalo, our African buffalo, and our friends, the cattle egrets, in this typical scene from a grassland in Africa. When you think about all the relationships among the organisms in the image, the plants, the birds, the mammals, the insects that are eating the grass, and so forth, there are lots of interactions happening here. We're starting to build up our community now through look, by looking at interspecific relationships and not just populations. So the insects are eating the grass, and the cattle egret are eating the grasshoppers, and the buffalo are stepping on the grasshoppers as they move, which the cattle egrets appreciate. And the cattle egrets, you know, they stand on their backs, and they may be the first ones as they fly around to see the lions or hyenas on the horizon, and they may squawk in a way that the buffalo recognizes as um, a danger on the horizon. So they may even communicate that way. All those things are happening, and all those are different types of relationship that we'll want to categorize. Usually the relationship between the cattle egret and the, bu the buffalo in a case like this would be called a commensalism. And a relationship where one member benefits, the bird benefits by going for a ride and by picking up the insects that are flushed or damaged, when, and the other organism has no, has no effect on it, no effect on the buffalo. But, as I mentioned, they, they can uh, act as sentries for the buffalo, and they may even benefit the buffalo in return, in which case you wouldn't call that a commensalism. An amensalism is a relationship that you don't even often see it in the textbooks, um, but it's, the one in, it's one in which an organism doesn't benefit from an interaction or be harmed by it, but another organism is harmed. And that would be the relationship between the buffalo and the grasshoppers that they step on. It's no, it's no um, hardship to the buffalo to step on a grasshopper, but it's certainly a hardship to the grasshopper to be stepped upon by a buffalo. And that would be an amensalistic relationship as opposed to commensalistic. And you can symbolize these just with positives and negatives or zeros for neutrality. So a commensal relationship would be a, a, a positive and a neutral, a positive and a zero. And an amensalism would be a zero and a negative. And I'll, I'll put a table up uh, here at the end to just summarize these things for you. Facilitation can be thought of in terms of a positive relationship for some organisms and a neutral effect on another participant. This happens a lot, where um, one organism, just by its being present, assists the um, growth and reproduction of another organism. A plant like this, this, uh, this rush, Juncus, when it grows in these flats, these salt marsh flats, by its presence, reduces evaporation, which can lead to toxic levels of salts building up. It aerates and oxygenates the soil, the mud, allowing um, thereby other organisms to flourish there. So in the presence of Juncus, these systems have lots of species growing there. But if you take Juncus out, and that's what these investigators did, they excluded Juncus, they saw that the number of species that could live there went down, because there are a certain number of species whose existence is facilitated by the presence of the Juncus. Even though the Juncus is just doing its thing, it's not necessarily trying to help these other creatures. A whole category of relationships that I prefer to call consumer resource relationships. Your book has a somewhat different um, scheme for, for representing these things. For example, your book calls herbivory a type of predation. We just don't do that. We just don't talk in terms of cows going out and preying upon grass in the fields. It's just awkward. So <clears throat> I find it better to call predation and herbivory, plant eating and um, the feeding on animal tissue, different types of consumer resource relationships. Predation is a big one. Creatures that eat um, other uh, animals that eat other animals, basically, is what we mean colloquially by predation, and it works fine scientifically. True predators have many hosts. You can think of the prey as a host in this sense. And the relationship is lethal. Uh, the, 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 prey, the prey dies in, in the process of predation. These praying mantises are exquisite predators, for example, of that. Herbivores are many, um, and herbivory is eating plants or eating algae. And yeah, caterpillars or, or green turtles or giraffes, of course, all herbivores. There are many, many herbivores, insect herbivores, all manner of herbivores. And yet the world remains more or less green. You look around and wherever you go, usually it's pretty green in the land, unless it's extremely arid. So with all these herbivores, ecologists have long asked, why is the world green then? Why aren't the resources kept down to such a level that um, they're struggling to carry on? It's actually a, a whole subfield of study. And the reasons are, turn out to be many. The factors that keep plants growing and common and abundant include the defenses that plants have. They don't just let themselves be eaten. They have chemical defenses and mechanical defenses like spines that deter herbivory. And then the herbivores are often themselves regulated, their populations, by predators. So it's a nice question to ask because it really inserts you in the whole community process of interspecific relationships. That question of why is the world green? Parasitism, another type of consumer resource relationship. The difference with predation is that the hosts are rarely killed. Uh, it doesn't behoove the parasite to kill its host because it needs something to eat.